Hey, welcome back to the news. Not gonna lie with you, this week's episode is uh, actually a pretty damn good one, so strap in and let's go, starting off with the release date leak. Well, this is a bit insane if true. This image is supposedly from an internal Activision Blizzard operations document that outlines the stages of readiness for teams to have in, you know, prep for some upcoming key releases. And that means it has dates. The soonest, of course, is Wrath Classic pre-patch and pre-sale. And what's interesting is that this, which says August 30th, was posted just hours before Blizzard themselves outlined that very same date. And that's eyebrow raising to say the least. Wrath Classic launches September 26th. After that, we've got Overwatch PvP Early Access, which sounds like how they're going to do that. And then Dragonflight pre-patch. October 25th, a full month before the supposed release date of November 28th. Now, a month-long pre-patch is actually entirely normal. BFAs was 28 days. The sheer madness of Legion's pre-patch was 42 days. Remember that? 42 days of absolutely absurd leveling. What a time that was. But the point is, it stands to reason. Then we've got Cod Cortez, which is actually the internal name for Modern Warfare 2. Modern Warfare 2 two, because they've made two Modern Warfare 2s, of course. Now, of note here is that the usual Call of Duty leakers that we follow because of our industry news channel, they are sharing this leak with, like, zero caveats, and it's usually, like, these are people who are in the know, so maybe that suggests that they know this is actually true. And then, of course, for us, the main event is Dragonflight, apparently November 28th. That's just a few days over two years after Shadowlands released which is generally how they do things. So is that realistic? Well, I'd say game-wise, we'll talk about the most recent beta soon, and I mean, potentially more and more as time goes on. Business-wise, does it make sense? I mean, yeah, they'll obviously want it out in that quarter. Now, the one issue players could have is some Christmas raiding. Blizzard have said that they've basically commented saying they will comment on this a bit later on. Uh, so they know people are talking about it, and you know, the people's problems are a few reasons. I mean, one, over the holiday, a lot of people just have shit to do. Two, fewer Blizzard staff would be around to monitor the race to world first. Now, of course, the race isn't all that important for the vast majority of players, but I think Blizzard know that if the race ended up being a bit of a disaster because of tuning, then they would start their expansion off with potentially a drama, and that would be a bit sad for everyone. Now, in Shadowlands, Nathria Normal and Heroic opened December 8th, Mythic opened on the 15th, and then Limit, now known as Liquid, they won that race, crossing the finish line at 9.58pm GMT, December 23rd. So, it was a bit awkward, but it did actually work out for that race. Now, this time around, it would be a bit more tricky because Dragonflight is, relatively speaking, launching just shy of a week later, uh, like in terms of days. Uh, than, than um, Shadowlands did. So, what do Blizzard, uh, what do they do? Well, here's the options, right? They could release the game, but delay raid to January. They could release the game in, I don't know, January, I guess. Uh, they could release the expansion a week earlier than what is in this document. Uh, they could, of course, then just proceed as this document says and just deal with Christmas raiding. And to be honest, I think they'll probably just do that. I imagine for most guilds, we'll just do what mine did last time and suspend formal raiding for a week. That's fine. I would rather have my hands on the expansion when I have some free time. Now, the main downside here is that some guilds might be super unreasonable about raiders not being around, um, which, I mean, that's <laughs> not to be insensitive, but that doesn't exactly sound like a guild that has its players' best interests at heart. And hitting up Twitter, plenty of the Race to World First people don't seem to be overly concerned about this kind of thing either. I suppose the bummer here is Blizzard's staff having to make a pretty shitty sacrifice. Um, so that's definitely something to think about, but I suppose people could then say, look at retail, look at healthcare, look at hospitality, look at all the other sectors where, and I don't do this to pull out some whataboutism, but you know, you, you got the point I'm making, right? Um, so who knows there? I mean, obviously if there's gonna be work done over that period, you would hope that people are especially well compensated for those hours. Now for the rest of us, look, tell you what, right? I don't know about you, but this is what it's like for me. If I get to be at home, get to be cozy, running some keys with my friends, exploring the world, doing the cool new reps we'll talk about soon in today's video, then hell yeah, I'd like to do that over the holiday. 
it's perhaps the one time I can actually play WoW like I used to when I was younger, so frankly, I would relish it. Now, finally, for this leak thingy, we've got the Diablo 4 pre-purchase and a reveal at the Game Awards. That's probably when we'll get the release date, and that all makes sense. The Game Awards is a massive event, and it will round off a quarter that we'll have seen Wrath Classic, Overwatch, a new retail expansion for WoW, a very strong sort of comeback story that Yabara and co. are undoubtedly wanting to craft. Now, D4 is currently in closed friends and family alpha right now, uh, especially, well, Schreier said that, but also some rather naughty screenshots got leaked, so I imagine somebody got in trouble there. But yeah, if the timings line up, that all makes sense, especially because they said that D4 would be out within a year of its uh, June this year uh, big event at Summer Games Fest. Overall, quite a time to be uh, in this sector of games. There's a lot of video game coming. Speaking of which, if you want to support the team that makes all of this content and also makes the game, which is literally happening right behind that wall, then our Patreon is a place to do that. And man, it's Rogue Month this month. The art that they have made is absolutely awesome. The Chimera pin is awesome. And thanks to all of your support, we've actually been able to uh, hire up a little bit. We've got a new member of staff joining soon who is going to be like, like one of her primary jobs is Patreon, ensuring that everything is ship shape, running good. I am super hyped about it. And uh, yeah, basically it's all really good stuff. So thanks for all your support. You can get all that dope art over there at that link down below. Okay, let's talk about the most recent alpha build. This is a really cool one. I think this is the one that's, I mean, honestly, I'm just thrilled about it. So we've now got an overview of Blizzard's non-instanced endgame content, and I am bloody well happy to tell you that the reps actually look like they're going to be pretty damn good this time around. In fact, it seems to be a massive, massive step up over every expansion since Mists of Pandaria in terms of that world content, at least in principle. I'm glad that now that they're returning to reps, they're actually trying to do them better. So let's get into this. There's four major factions. Each one has a renown bar, but don't worry about the Shadowlands issues. You can be a member of all of these reps at the same time. You can progress them all at the same time. The renown bar is just another way of displaying reputation. So each renown level looks like this. Basically, it looks like a small rep bar, right? And you just, you know, you just keep on filling those, you go up the renown levels. Now, of course you fill those, uh, you know, the rep bars by doing world content. And that is where things look a bit different. So each rep is heavily themed with unique gameplay, and I'm gonna go through them now. We've got the Valdrakan Accord. They have got profession work orders, activities, and exploration, so loads there for the crafters. Blizzard, of course, really being serious about crafting being a true way to play World of Warcraft. They also have dragon riding racing content. That's awesome, I really want that. Trust me, I played it on Alpha. It is fun as hell. And then they've got elite mob areas and a big siege against the uh, Jaradine, uh, like the big giant people. So basically there's something there for almost everybody. And I suppose with the reps, I hope we get similar feelings to those Timeless Isle elites that I think were very successful. Next then, the Dragon Scale Expedition, which is basically our factions from the Alliance and the Horde kind of banding together, right? The Explorers Guild and the Reliquary. So they have loads of treasures as well as two new types of world quest rock climbing and cataloging. Now the rock climbing looks really neat. There was actually a like tutorial quest for that in I believe Owner and Plains. Um, and you know, you're just clicking around doing some rock climbing. It was very much one where you couldn't fail, but there are like rock climbing segments in world quests, I believe where you, you know, where you can fail, you actually have to do it properly. And there's even progression to that. And then the other one, the cataloging quests, those seem to be Pokemon Snap. And let me tell you, I would not have given a shit about that like two years ago, but since I actually played Pokemon Snap on a Nintendo Switch and was shocked how enjoyable I found it, uh, yeah, that's really big. Another nice thing about the rock climbing too though, you can rock climb super high and then you can drag and ride to your next thing. So it's a really great like uh, gameplay flow. Look, this is them shaking it up, trying something different, trying to make world quests that aren't just go kill the dude go collect some bear asses, it's, it's not that. So basically, this is experimentation. Well, I mean, what different types of gameplay? Madness. <laughs> and then of course you can, you know, progress and become better at rock climbing, better at treasure hunting. So there's a whole thing there. 
Then the Tuscar, they have loads of fishing content, which includes like fishing, you know, those like little ice holes, fishing in different biomes, and also dropping fishing nets for offline progress, and all of that has got further progression. There's also a feast event. Basically, it's a, like a, a marker will appear on the map, uh, talking, you know, showing the event. It will give you 10 minutes to arrive, I believe. And uh, then like the whole group just contributes to making a big soup. So it's kind of neat. Uh, there's a whole, you know, different stages to it. The better you do, the better the hour long buff that you get at the end will be, uh, plus more rewards, I imagine. They've also got a few elite mob locations as well. I mean, hey, they're the Tuscar. I think they're gonna be popular. Um, looks like you can get some nice mugs from them as well. And then finally, we've got the Maruk Centaur. So there's a nomadic tribe of them that has a caravan that travels across the zone, giving you different things to do at each stop of the caravan. There's uh, hunts that you can join. I believe there's actually progress within the various Centaur uh, characters as well. So yeah, definitely one I wanna get some more testing in on. And this is just brilliant to me. You know, I've been sad about the state of reputation since the end of Mists of Pandaria. I mean, after that, they just turned into bars to, to grind or, you know, the, the world quest ones where every single rep feels the same. Here, they all seem to feel different. They seem to be more themed in their gameplay. This actually seems like Blizzard making a decently major move towards quality world content, and that is so, so damn welcome. Now, this build also brings level 70 character templates, so that's big, we can test the endgame. There's another dungeon that our uh, resident cutting edge raider, Dakor, absolutely loved. It's across the whole centaur zone, and it involves dragon riding. And I know some people could be a bit salty about the dragon riding being involved in the dungeon, but look, honestly, it's fun as shit, and he said it was really, really cool. So yeah, I think that dungeon is big hype. Then monks have got their talents. We've seen a few more waves of iteration on other classes. Still a few outstanding ones, but hopefully those come in soon. And overall with this, I would say that beta is probably only a week or two away now that we're actually having max level character templates. Also, here's the login screen. Give me a simple yes or no down in the comments. Should we put a dragon in it? I mean, it'd be kind of cute to have Syndragosa there in the Wrath Classic login screen, and then maybe Alex Straza on live, right? Okay, next, we've actually got even more good shit. Patch 9.2.7 is here, bringing with it the first version of the new mobile auction house, region-wide commodities, and importantly for many of us, a new chat channel specifically for boosting, along with a new policy and that policy is good news. So with the new boosting channel in existence, any promotion of selling boosts, carries, or similar services in return for gold that are posted in the regular trade chat will officially be considered spam with proper action taken. Fuck yeah. If somebody is selling a boost in trade chat, you right click in that sucker and report it. If you don't want to see boosting in your chat channel, open up settings, disable the channel. I know I will. Now, of course, a policy is only as good as enforcement, so that better be good. <laughs> I mean, at least it seems like this would be a fairly simple thing to automate. But look, if trade is still a mess, then we can say, hey, Blizzard, you're not holding up your end of the bargain here. A bit like with a pre-made group finder, which sometimes is still full of boosting spam. But hey, on the very least, it was nice to log into Twitter that morning and just see loads of people tweeting screenshots of them disabling the trade services channel. So overall, that should clean things up. As for the likes of the regional commodities, honestly, I've been out of the econ game for such a long time in WoW that I just have to imagine it'll average out prices and that'll be good for some servers, less good for other servers. We'll just have to see how it shakes out. Certainly for buyers and smaller servers, this will be really good. Um, maybe less good for some gold makers who prefer the gameplay of a smaller server. Now, Blizzard did actually have to disable the AH for a little bit, but I believe that has since been resolved. Season 4 then! Look, Blizzard have been making great changes on live. The Conquest cap? Gone! Spoils of War buff! That's back for the whole season, giving people 25% Conquest and 40% Honor gains. They've also then raised the minimum item level floor for Solo Shuffle to 278. Now, of course, yeah, the PvP cosmetic rewards are a bit lame, and that just is what it is. In other news then, Blizzard also doubled cosmic flux drops from incidents to content. That's pretty sweet. Sure does make the 10,000 needed for uh, all of your 278 conduits a bit nicer. Uh, but seriously though, even just doing a quick LFR wing, that drops like 250 a boss, I think, so you do get a ton of flux that way. 
Now, also, in addition to the new conduit uh, item, Flux is used for making your tier and also max rank legendaries, plus unlocking a few nice legendary powers, which I definitely did appreciate on my new Discipline Priest. Overall, then, it's just wonderful to see how active and responsive Blizzard are being this time around with this season, especially with the likes of Dungeon Tuning. This uh, is honestly so much better than what we've been used to. The most recent wave of hotfixes is actually great. They added in a new blue swirly that telegraphs the thunderous breath ability during the last boss encounter in Grimrail Depot. By the way, Grimrail Depot, I mean, I love it. It's awesome. But God damn, that's a fun time in Sanguine, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I just love a camera in an MMO. Uh, but look, it is brilliant. Uh, you know, the older, less refined design language kind of hurt that encounter, so it's nice to see Blizzard make a change there. It's just a lot more clear now, and I imagine, especially for those higher keys where it's a lot more punishing, that this would be great. Also, damn, those lower Kara nerfs. Uh, so look, this is a hyper-responsive Blizzard, right? And if this is in any way indicative of how Blizzard will treat Dragonflight, then I've got to say, things are on the up. Okay, look at this. This is a vendor with a range of item level 252 gear that is on sale for a new currency called Primeval Essence. It's on the beta. Uh, now, many have speculated that this is actually the pre-patch catch-up gear, and we've also got a few data mine snippets that clue us in to what this pre-patch event might be. Apparently, there are going to be four primalist invasions across different regions of Azeroth. Uh, these seem to include Ungoro, Badlands, Northern Barrens, and Tirasfall Glades, with each one being a different aspected elemental presence. Seems kind of neat. I think it would be double cool if Blizzard could tap into the Legion pre-patch event power and really give us some of those good leveling speeds. Uh, if you weren't there, then I'm... It's, it's a shame, because Legion pre-patch was one of the most incredible moments. We just came out of this really rough period of Warlords of Draenor, and that event just slapped super hard and straight up it... I mean, it, it was kind of bananas how fast you could level up your characters. It was crazy. But goddamn, did it get people back into the game. The sheer quantities of players that, that were seen, it, it, I mean, after playing WAD when we were stuck in our garrisons, it was just absurd. You know, to see the skies of Azeroth just awash with, with flying mounts and massive swarms of players, it was super cool. So hopefully Blizz are able to kind of recapture that. So there you go. Look, that's the news for this week. Uh... Almost all good stuff, actually. That's nice to say. I mean, hey, if Dragonflight doesn't have all of the borrowed power bullshit that took out Shadowlands, it has world content that's a step up, dungeons that are really good, raids that are really good. I mean, damn, that kind of sounds like the sort of thing we've been asking for for a long time. We, of course, just need to have the class progression actually be fun. So, there you go. I'm not going to say pre-order, obviously, but I think there are plenty of reasons for cautious optimism at this stage of time. Which is a pretty insane thing. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you told me that a year ago when it was, uh, you know, 9.1 PTR times, I don't think I would have believed you. All right, that's it for me. Look, if you want to support the team, get some badass loot and that kind of thing, you can check out the Patreon down below. Other than that, though, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.